Any questions about last session? Any questions in general? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I really like the, the spatial transformers paper. That was sort of like a form of, you know, learned attention. I was wondering if it's, uh, if there's plans for anything similar or if you could point me to some like papers that are like similar ideas. I think uh, when we do uh, object detection, we are gonna see some more examples there, at least one more paper. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I can look up some papers for you. Sure, I will send Thanks. you Thanks, sweet. And any other questions in general? I was gonna ask if, um, if, if you had any like code examples that would go along with the slides, not necessarily everyone, but just any that you have, they would be helpful, not to review during class, but to uh, run and go through on our own. Most of these papers are really amazing. So they are sharing their codes on GitHub. Uh, you can simply Google, for instance, SqueezeNet and TensorFlow, and then uh, the corresponding code is going to show up. Somebody has written the code. OK, thanks. But yeah, if you go through that, and I know that one of you did that, and I really liked it. One of you was going through the implementation of weight initializations in PyTorch. Because usually these are hidden. You usually say, OK, I want to add a convolution with this activation. And then behind the scenes, things are being taken care of. They are going to initialize it correctly for you. But that's going to be great if you can uh, go through the code. Because this is a great learning experience, going through the codes of others. And most of these papers that I'm covering, you can download the code for free it's, and play around with it. I mean, these community are amazing. They cite it, each other perfectly. They use each other's codes. And that's why the field is exploding, because nobody is hiding information. So yeah, I strongly encourage that, to go through the codes. And I strongly encourage looking at the data as well, the type of data that these people used. So far, it was mostly ImageNet. But then when we go to object detection and uh, segmentation and I don't know, visual question answering, et cetera, then the type of data is going to change. Usually the size of data is going to become smaller, and then you have to limit that. But the data are going to become different. So it's a great experience going through the data and the codes of others. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Unless you're right, Kevin. Some of them have their code already included in tf.keras. And there is also TensorFlow Hub. There is also PyTorch. They have a hub also. and. Uh, MXNet also has a very good, I can pull it up actually. If you look at MXNet for computer vision, blue one, they have a model zoo and they have very good uh, documentation. I think if you go to model zoo, yes, you can have classification. And then most of the models that we covered so far, like ResNet, ResNext, ResNest, MobileNet, VDG, SqueezeNet, SqueezeNet, we covered it last session. You can take a look at the details here. And they have nice tutorials. Some of you are going through the tutorials of PyTorch and TensorFlow. And yes, Surush is right. TensorFlow Hub is also very good. You can download the data sets. You can download the codes, etc., from other people. OK, so use that opportunity, I mean. For me, it's more important to show you what's behind the scenes, what is behind the methods. Most of these, you can easily implement them. Does that sound good? They have tutorials you can go through. They have models or images. For instance, you have the efficient net, and the code is here. And you have different types of efficient nets. You can get a saved model, or you can actually train it from scratch. This is as easy as this. You get your tf.cras sequential, and then, and then you say, I want from TensorFlow Hub, give me efficient net, and it's going to give you that. Does that sound good? Oh, Theodore is saying, what was the first site? That was MXNet. This is a collaboration from a big zoo of companies. These are sponsoring, and they have some employees actually contributing the, to the code, like Intel, NVIDIA, Acer, etc. That's why I'm keeping your hands open, because there is a lot of things that I'm not going to have time to teach you. That's why I'm giving you guys the opportunity to explore. Just learn as much as you can, not only from me, but from the, from the world, from the internet. And MXNet is actually where you have this textbook that I'm recommending for this course, okay? This textbook is also very good. 
and I know that some of you are going through it, which is great. It's a compliment to what we do in class. Any other questions? There is also PyTorch. They have very good tutorials, etc. They also have a model zoo. See, all of these models are already implemented for you. We can go ahead and take a look at the details of how they are implementing it and just try to look for what we covered in class. So this is how you explore. Any other questions? Okay, then let's move on with XNOR Lens. We said uh, we have an image, it has C channels, it has a width and a height. We have a bunch of kernels, our weights, with kernel size W times H. It has the same number of channels as your input. We said we want to approximate W by alpha times B, where B is binary. And then we said we want alpha to be positive because we are capturing the positiveness and negativeness in B. If we do so, convolution operation is gonna need only addition and subtraction. So I have a question for you in general. So the memory saving went from one to 32 when we did binary weights, but then it went from 30 to, 30 to 32 when we binarized the input. Why is that? Why didn't it change? Why didn't we save more? It's just a question to see whether you know the big picture. Because we're not saving the input like the, the weights are the main thing that are saved in memory for our model. Like the input is just like a per forward pass basis kind of thing. Exactly. So what you're saving are the weights and biases. So you're not saving your inputs. You can binarize it on the fly. An image comes in and then you binarize whenever necessary. And you don't need to save that. Okay, great. Now we said we want our weights and biases to be flattened. In Python, you're just going to say dot flatten. Then it's going to turn a tensor into a long vector of dimension C, W, and H. Now our problem becomes minimizing the distance between W and alpha B. If you expand that term out, you get alpha squared B transpose B minus 2 alpha W transpose B plus W transpose W. We know that our binary matrix is going to have either a value of positive one or negative one. If you multiply two negatives, it's gonna give you a positive. And if you multiply two positives, it's gonna give you a positive. So the entries here are always ones. And then you are doing a summation because of the inner product here. So you're doing a summation over N ones. So that's gonna give you N. And this term is just constant because our problem, this minimization problem is a function of B and alpha. It's not a function of W. We are assuming that W is no. So let's try to minimize and find beta star and alpha star. Minimizing this objective is equivalent to maximizing, if you are trying to find beta, is equivalent to maximizing this term because of this negative sign and alpha is positive. So it's equivalent to maximizing this term. The rest of it is either a constant or n, which is also a constant. And because we are not op optimizing yet for alpha, that term is also a constant. It's equivalent to maximizing this. And the answer to that problem is very simple. Whenever W is positive, enforce it, make beta to be positive. If W is negative, make the product of beta and W to be positive. It means set beta I to be negative. Then overall, you're adding a bunch of positive numbers and that's gonna give you the maximum. And that's gonna give you B star, which is simply the sign of W. Any questions up until this point? So up until this point, we covered that session. Now we want to find alpha. If you want to find alpha, you just take the derivative of this objective function with respect to alpha. It's gonna give you two alpha n minus two alpha minus two w transpose b. And then you can solve for alpha. You set that to be equal to zero and then you solve for alpha. That's gonna give you w transpose b divided by n. And that's what you see here. From above, we know what is the optimal b. We plug that inside this term. That's the sign of w. And because of this transpose, you're doing an inner product and that's gonna give you the summation. And whenever you multiply a number by its sign, you're gonna get the absolute value of that term. If W is positive, the sign is gonna be positive. Therefore, the absolute value is just WI. If W is negative, the sign is negative. You multiply them together, that's gonna give you the positive term. So it's always the absolute value. And what is that? That's just the, L1 norm. That's just the definition of L1 norm. So far, so good. 
Now what we are gonna do is how are we gonna train this? That's the question. A mini batch comes in, we are gonna keep a copy of W throughout the training, but our forward pass is gonna go through this term, alpha and B, rather than using W. So let's see some details. At iteration T, you took some mini batch and uh, you got some WT. That's what you're starting with during training. That's iteration T of your optimization. Now, given WT, you can compute alpha and beta because we know how to find the optimal ones. This is our alpha coming from this formula and B is just the sign of WT. So these we can compute. And from this approximation here, we can define WT tilde, which is gonna be alpha T times BT. And we should note that W is not equal to WT tilde. WT tilde is approximating W. It's not exact. But then how are we gonna backpropagate? We can take the derivative of our loss with respect to this term. That's gonna give you the derivative of your loss with respect to that term, the approximate one. You take a step in the direction of your gradient. That's gonna be gradient descent. And that's how you update W for the next iteration. So you always keep a copy of W during back propagation. But for forward propagation, we are always going through this route. We are always using WT tilde. So we are always going through this route or that route. Is that clear? Okay, perfect. So we covered binary weight. How are we gonna binarize the input? You do exactly the same exercise. It's gonna be exactly the same math that's gonna go through and that's gonna help you binarize your input and then you are gonna have a scaling factor, let's call it beta, that's all. So it's the same math, but then there is a minor catch when it comes to implementation to make it efficient. For binarizing weights, we know how to do it. We can compute alpha and beta. For binarizing the inputs, sorry, that's B. We know how to compute alpha and B. For binarizing the inputs, we are gonna do convolutions. You take a small window of your input and then from that, you're gonna compute beta one corresponding to X1 window. For X2 window, you're gonna compute beta two and you're gonna put it in a matrix K. But then as you can see, there is some redundancy in your computations here. You need to compute this norm for this window and the other window and they have some overlap. So you're doing redundant computations here. Is that clear, the problem? So there is a slight catch here that there are some redundancy going on. The question is, how are we gonna fix it? You compute A, because in the end, what do you need? You need the L1 norm of your input. You need the L1 norm, and that's the definition of the L1 norm. It's the summation of the absolute value. So we are gonna do the summation of our input, and we are doing uh, a average pooling, but this time over the channels. So you're averaging the absolute value your, of your input over the channel. So the summation here is over the channel. It means that you're gonna take an input and collapse it into a matrix A. It's one intermediate step that's gonna give you A, but to get the norm, what, what else do we need? What is the size of this input? It has C channels and the size is W times H. So that's a small window. And we know that in our L1 norm, we are gonna need to divide by C times W times H. That's the total number of elements that you're gonna have. So you're gonna define Kij, which is exactly what we need. It's one over W times H. And the rest of it is just a simple convolution. You take that matrix, which is always a constant, one over W times H, and then you slide it over your A. And we know that convolutions can be implemented very efficiently. And that's gonna give you B1 and B2 through a convolution operation. And the rest of it is clear now. We are gonna approximate I convolved with W by the sine of I convolved with the sine of W, a Hadamard product with your K matrix that we just created in an efficient way times alpha. So K is gonna contain betas coming from binarizing our input. Alpha is coming from binarizing our weights and the sign of these two matrices are here. So is everything clear? So just to be clear, the, um, the K matrix has a whole, all, each entry is one specific number beta, which comes from the convolution of just like that region that you've drawn in the um, input. 
that you've called X1 or X2, but there's, there's a whole bunch of them. It's not just the first and the second. Yes, there is a whole bunch of them. Okay. It's just the last duration of the overlap between yeah. two windows, but then you're going to need to do it for every single window over there. So it's, it's K is just as big as the standard output after doing convolution. Exactly. So K is going to have a size of W in times H in. That's how many betas you're going to have. Yeah. The size of your input. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. I want everything to be clear before moving on. Okay, then. Now there is a slight catch also. Where do you want to put your pooling? If you have a binarized input, like this input, ones and negative ones, and let's say you want to do max pooling on a window of two by two, the max is most of the time is going to be one and you're losing a lot of information. So if you want to do the pooling right after the activation, we are in trouble or right after the batch norm when things are binarized. That's a typical CNN, but then a block of XNOR net is just a slight rearrangement of furniture for you to lose as little information as possible. You do your batch norm, you do your binary activation, and by binary activation, we mean this, this operation that you see here. That's the binary activation, and then binary convolution is this operation here. So that's the operation that we're gonna do in this box, Binary activation is the operation that you do there. And then you do the pooling right after the completion. Because now things are not binarized. What goes inside the pooling is not a bunch of ones and negative ones. There are some real numbers also there. There is alpha and betas. That way you're not going to lose that much information. You're still losing information. If you see the accuracy is dropping, but it's not crazy compared to the computational saving that you're going to get. And why is it faster? Because XNOR operations are what actually the hardware does. It's the basic operation in hardware. Okay, how much do we save? That depends. If you are using VGG19, from one gigabyte of a model, you're gonna go to 16 megabytes, from 100 to 1.5 in ResNets, and from 475 to 7.4. So that depends on the network that you have. How much speed up are you gonna get? That depends. The more channels you have, the more computationally expensive your convolutions are, and the more you're gonna save. So the bigger the number of channels, the more you're gonna save. And the bigger your filter size, the more you're gonna save. Okay. So these are intuitive figures. Any questions before I move on to the next topic? Is the, uh, is sort of the loss in accuracy um, from this process constant? Um, for these two metrics, for this number of channels and filter size, or will the accuracy decrease more or something? That's a great question. So definitely it's not gonna be constant because there is a training process going on and things are gonna be random. So I cannot give you a definite answer that it's always this much accuracy that you're losing. You could be losing more or less, okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't have a definite answer to that. Any other questions? 